Hello, Camden. So on my way here, I spoke to a $100 device in my kitchen, and I asked it if my flight was on time and asked it to call me a car. A few minutes later, a lift showed up to take me to the airport. Anybody seeing this even five years ago would have said, WTF, which of course stands for what's the future. Uh, but there are a lot of people who are hearing the stories of artificial intelligence and other frontier technologies, and they're saying WTF with a very different tone of voice and with the meaning that we're all used to. And they're worried because they hear that 47% of jobs are at risk of being automated in the next 20 years. They hear that there may be nothing left to humans for humans to do, and we may need universal basic income. We'll all be on welfare of some kind. Now, there are a lot of people who are hearing this, and they're feeling the economic pain in their lives, and they're not happy. You know, Occupy Wall Street was the first of a, way, a series of waves of populist sentiment, uh, which are not over. We're facing a lot of economic disruption, and fairly or unfairly, technology is being blamed as one of the causes. Now, of course, we've been there before. You've probably all heard the term Luddite. It's actually a reference to a mythical figure. Uh, Ned Ludd never existed, uh, but it was the, the name that was taken up by a group of weavers in the early 1800s who, despite the current narrative about uh, Luddites, were not opposed to technology. They were workers who wanted a seat at the table. They wanted to talk uh, about how the, the benefits would be allocated, what the working conditions would be. Sound familiar? So this was a populist movement. But the mill owners would have saved themselves uh, decades of upheaval if they had gone more quickly to realize that the fruits of productivity needed to be shared more widely. But the point is, neither the weavers of the rebellion nor the mill owners could imagine the incredible bounty that was going to be brought to us by the Industrial Revolution. They couldn't imagine that ordinary people would have more clothing than the kings and queens of Europe, that all of us would have the opportunity to eat fruit in the middle of winter. They couldn't imagine that we'd build a skyscraper in the desert a half mile high, that we'd put satellites into space, that we'd split the atom, that we'd land on the moon, that we'd fly through the air, that we'd dig a tunnel from England to France. And they also couldn't imagine that their, their great-grandchildren would live twice as long as they do. Now, here's an amazing graph from Our World in Data, which is a wonderful resource uh, put out by Max Roser, uh, where he shows graphs about the many ways that the world is getting better. And this is a very striking one, because it's life expectancy. And you see, going back to the 1500s, there were periods where life expectancy got worse. You know, you had plagues, you had wars, uh, but it never got better until the mid-1800s. And what the multiple lines on this graph are, are additional countries as they became industrialized. And you see the graph start to go up and to the right. So clearly, our industrial technological society is doing something right, right? And yet, we also have a failure of imagination. We're still struggling with those issues that they were struggling with back in the beginning of the uh, Industrial Revolution. Because look at this graph. Look how productivity, the dark blue line, continues to go up and to the right. But that somehow in the 1980s, real median family income in America started to flatten out. Why? What's our failure of imagination? What are we missing? There's plenty to go around. It's just not going around. So we have to ask ourselves, what should we be doing differently with technology and why we aren't doing it? We should be asking what work needs doing, how work is changing. What does technology make possible today that was previously impossible? Because that wonderful march of magic that WTF of astonishment is still with us. It's still happening. 
How do we make the world prosperous for everyone? And why aren't we doing it? Why aren't we doing it? And so we've heard a lot about this from economists and financial writers. Uh, Thomas Piketty's Capital in the 21st Century really put inequality on everybody's radar. Uh, was a topic that suddenly it was safe for policymakers and uh, economists to talk about. Uh, but there are others. Uh, 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 Darren uh, Duran Asimoglu talks wonderfully about uh, why nations fail, why extractive economies uh, are not as durable, if you look at history, as inclusive economies. Uh, uh, there have been authors like Rana Faruhar uh, writing about the financialization of the, of the American economy or the, the modern uh, industrial economy and why we're no longer investing in the real economy of goods and services for people. Instead, we're investing in a, a gambling economy uh, of stocks and bonds and financial derivatives. And that's actually simply a, a market that only some small number of people get to play in. And it really does not increase the wealth of the world. So I've written a book uh, which really tries to explore this from a technology point of view, and in particular, explores what the great technology platforms have to teach us about the future of work, business, and the economy. And there, there are many, many lessons, but the first one is that our maps of the world can steer us wrong. Now, this isn't a technology story, except to the extent that you think of map making as one of the fundamental human technologies. But in 1625, they thought that California was an island. This map uh, was actually stolen uh, from the Dutch, uh, became, uh, actually, it was, sorry, take it back. It was the Dutch who stole it from the Portuguese. And then it became the accepted wisdom for about 100 years that California was an island. And people made wrong decisions based on that map. But it didn't stop there, because in my career in technology, I saw how people didn't understand that the world was changing. Microsoft didn't see Google coming. Google didn't see the iPhone coming. And you know, this is what we thought a connected taxi cab looked like <laughs> in 2005. You, know, you put a screen in the back, and you show ads. How cool is that? <laughs> Not very. Uh, <laughs> you know, so, when I hear that in 2017, we think that technology will take all the jobs and leave nothing for humans to do, I say that's an example of this same kind of framing blindness. We're seeing the world in terms of what we know. We're not seeing the world in terms of what is possible today. So here's what I think is happening, gradually, then suddenly. Now, I love that phrase. It comes actually from Ernest Hemingway who used it to describe bankruptcy. <laughs> he, uh, he, uh, one of the characters uh, asked another guy named Mike, he says, Mike, how did you become bankrupt? And he said, well, two ways, gradually, then suddenly. <laughs> and, and of course, that's how technology happens to us. You know, we got, uh, you know, from that connected taxi cab of 2005 uh, to Lyft and Uber gradually, and then suddenly. And, all of a sudden, that was the new paradigm. So what's happening today? The world, not just this sort of abstract world of computers, but the world that we know that we live in is becoming infused with the digital. Artificial intelligence and algorithmic systems are everywhere around us. We are actually living in the algorithmic system. Facebook shapes what we think, what we see, what we believe. Uh, Google uh, does the same. Uh, you know, we, we're increasingly living in a world uh, that is ruled by algorithms. But in that process, we are creating new kinds of partnerships between machines and humans. Now, here's what happens when you do it right. Between 2014 and the middle of 2016, and I'm sure it's continued since then, Amazon added 45,000 robots to their warehouses. Did they put people out of work? No, actually, they added 250,000 employees, many of them in those same warehouses. Why? Why? Here's what happened. You think, in the old paradigm, those robots are going to be used to do the same thing that you did before, just more efficiently. So you can get rid of people, right? But no, Amazon said, wow, we can pack more products into those warehouses. We can get them out faster. We can have more products that we can deliver next day. In fact, in some zip codes, we're going to start delivering same day, right? And that's why 
they, they, they uh, generated more jobs. This is the magic. Do more with technology. Don't do the same thing more efficiently. Uh, Jeff Bezos calls this the flywheel. You know, uh, you know, better service, better customer experience leads to more traffic, which draws in more sellers into the platform, which means there's a greater selection of products, at a lower cost structure, lower prices, and this thing goes round and round in a flywheel. And that's that same miracle that we saw of increased productivity, doing more in agriculture, in the production of, of industrial goods that brought us to our modern prosperity. But there's another piece to this, which my friend Nick Hanauer, who was Amazon's first non-family investor, calls the fundamental law of capitalism. When workers have more money, companies have more customers, and then they hire more workers. That's also a flywheel. And we've interrupted that flywheel because at some point, we convinced ourselves that people were a cost to be eliminated. So how did that happen? And that requires me to give you a little bit of a lesson on what's really happening in this gradually then suddenly world. When we're afraid of robots, we tend to focus on the thing, the robot itself, the self-driving car. But these coming robots are not autonomous. This is what a self-driving car looks like, and it's in this complex with humans and machines. And it's going to be in a mix. There are going to be drivers dispatched by algorithm. If we get to the self-driving cars of Uber, they will also be dispatched by algorithm, but they're going to be in a mix, and there's going to be new kinds of services delivered in those cars. Uber already showed us that. You know, they had an experiment which they run every, every fall uh, where they let you use Uber to call for a flu shot, and a nurse shows up. So imagine self-driving cars delivering new kinds of services. So you have to think differently about what's happening with this, this cognitive revolution, where these massive digital systems with data centers, at, which are trained by humans, learning from humans, guiding humans at the same time, are these massive swarming marketplaces that bring us together in unexpected new ways that we don't quite understand yet. But there's a really important concept from biology that I want to introduce here, which is the idea of symbiogenesis. Now, Lynn Margulis, in 1967, made a very controversial assertion, which had actually been made uh, uh, decades earlier, in 1908, I believe, by a Russian biologist, that the organelles inside of multicellular organisms chloroplasts in plants, mitochondria in, uh, in animals, are actually bacteria that took up residence inside the cells of other organisms. This was unproven until uh, genetics was able to show that these organelles actually have different DNA than the cell nucleus. And so this is a whole idea that uh, species are, are composite entities that are formed by fusion and merger. Now, this is not the only mechanism of evolution, but it's a really important one. And guess what? Here it is, technological symbiogenesis, a human mitochondrion inside the Google data center. Now, it's not just the people who are fixing the machines or swapping out servers. They're, this is one of the fundamental insights that I had 15 years ago about how software was changing, that it has the programmer still inside it. There are people and business processes inside of Google. It's not a software artifact anymore. There are people who are telling it every day what to do, uh, who are improving its algorithms. It's a partnership of humans and machines. And if either went away, Google would stop working. Just think about it for a minute. Everybody who links to something on the web is giving input to Google. Everyone who clicks on a link or an ad is giving input to Google. So you are part of Google. And then the programmers writing those algorithms, they check, hey, did they do what we want? Oh, wait, there's some spammers who are interfering with what we thought we were trying to do. We've got to change the algorithms to deal with that. So this is constant dynamic. And now, of course, we're spreading out into this world of uh, services like you know, maps and directions which actually tell humans what to do. So it's this technological symbiosis. We're building this uh, new combined organism. But you have to realize that Google and Facebook are not the only ones, these hybrid uh, proto-AIs. Uh, this is the Equinix NY4 data center, 
uh, where trillions of dollars from Wall Street and financial firms change hands. It is also one of these great symbiotic organisms. So here's the thing. When you have these algorithmic systems partnered with humans, they have what you could call an objective function or an optimization function or a fitness function. So Uber and Lyft are building algorithms that say, we have to actually build a marketplace of drivers such that in any location, people can get picked up within three to five minutes. Google says, we want to actually build these systems such that when people search for something, they find what they want on the first try. That's their aspiration. They don't always get it. They want people to click on ads and go away. They don't want them to come back and look at another one. Facebook, on the other hand, has systems that say, hey, we want you to come look at stuff, and then we want you to look at more stuff. And we want you to share it with your friends and spend more time engaged with, our, with what we do. And then you have scheduling systems. People think, oh, wow, those drivers at Uber, they're managed by an algorithm. Well, so are workers at Walmart or The Gap or McDonald's. They're all managed now by scheduling algorithms. And those scheduling algorithms say, oh, we're going to figure out how to optimize for using as little human labor as possible. We're going to tell people when to show up and go home in micro shifts. And hey, we can even program these things to make sure that nobody gets more than 29 hours a week so we don't have to pay them full-time health benefits. Awesome. So that's not actually awesome. That's the WTF of dismay. Because we're using that technology to say, wow, let's get rid of people. I prefer ones that say, we're going to put people to work. And of course, Uber and Lyft show the same dynamic as Amazon. They've actually put millions of people to work around the world. But here's the thing. Like the genies of Arabian mythology, our digital genies do exactly what we tell them to do. Right? You all know the story from you know, the Arabian Nights, or maybe you watched uh, Walt Disney's Fantasia and saw Mickey Mouse with the broomsticks. You know, we don't quite understand what we're asking for. And as a result, the genies go wild. They give us something that is exactly what we asked for, but not what we meant. Now, I had a friend uh, in the early days of, of Macintosh programming who said something very wise to me, uh, which has stuck with me ever since. He said, the art of debugging is figuring out what you really told your program to do rather than what you thought you told your program to do, <laughs> right? And so Facebook didn't mean to increase hyperpartisanship. They thought they were building algorithms that would increase the connection between people. But there were spammers, bad actors. Uh, we all participated by getting hyped up and, and sharing and uh, showing our friends and commenting on the things that were most divisive. They didn't mean that. Similarly, when Milton Friedman in 1970 said the social responsibility of business is to increase its profits, he didn't mean to increase inequality and gut our economy. When Michael Jensen at Harvard Business School took up this call and said we have to align CEO pay with stock prices, they didn't necessarily mean to gut the ordinary economy of of regular people. They didn't mean for United Airlines to drag passengers off airplanes, but they did. Just as, so, just as we expect Facebook to fix its algorithms to stop feeding fake news to us, we need to expect our financial markets to stop telling the world to hollow out the economy, to optimize for rich people, and stop telling it to get rid of work for ordinary people, because that's what we're doing. So it isn't technology that wants to eliminate jobs. That's what we're telling it to do. Technology wants to do the impossible. It wants to solve hard problems. You know, uh, Nick Hanauer again says, prosperity in human societies is best understood as the accumulation of solutions to human problems. We won't run out of work till we run out of problems, right? We won't run out of work till we run out of problems. Are we done? Are we done yet? Look around. There's plenty of work to be done. What's keeping us from doing it? It's this master fitness function of the rogue AI that we're building in our financial systems that say, ignore what the world really needs, optimize for share price, get rid of people if they're in the way. So, we should be dealing with climate change. We should be rebuilding our infrastructure, feeding the world, ending disease, resettling refugees, caring for each other, and enjoying the fruits of shared prosperity. Technology is amazingly powerful. 
It can help us do all these things, but we have to tell technology to do that. You know, we have flaming, framing blindness about economic policy and politics, not just technology. You know, what would it take for us to put people to work tackling these great problems? What would it take for us to treat humans as assets, not liabilities? What would it take for us to create an economy based on caring and creativity? Let the damn machines focus on repetitive tasks. You know, what would it take to apply these on-demand marketplace models to healthcare? You know, so we augmented community healthcare workers with telemedicine and AI. What if we gave everyone access to knowledge on demand whenever we need it? What could we do differently? How could we have fresh approaches to public policy? You know, based on what's possible now, rather than kind of just going back to the old, tired solutions that were maybe the best solution we could do 50, 60, 70 years ago. No, let's figure out what's possible now. Let's build the future that we can imagine. So that's why the most important words in the title of my book are, it's up to us. Thank you. <laughs>